Welcome to today's webinars of the Gerha Center webinar series, The Aftermath of the COVID-19, the New Social Impact Ecosystem. Today, we're very honored to have with us Erin Ganju to speak about Scaling Global Change, a social entrepreneur's guide to surviving the startup phase and driving impact. Erin will share practical experience, practical business lessons from scaling a social enterprise, Room to Read, which has impacted the education of over 15 million children globally. Erin will highlight key lessons from the story of its growth, growth of the Room to Read, and from Erin's book, Scaling Global Change, which is how to guide for social entrepreneurs who have a vision to change the world and are looking for advice on how to build a strong organizational foundation to do it. Erin will share insights on what it it took for this internationally renowned education nonprofit to cross the chasm between a startup to mature, worldwide brand recognition, influence, and global impact. She will also highlight areas around program effectiveness, how to strengthen operational excellence, and grow organization strategic influence. Currently, Erin is a managing director at Shidna Giving one of the largest private funders in girls' education in lower-income countries. Girls are most disadvantaged when it comes to education. Erin joined Chinda Giving from Room to Read. During her tenure at Room to Read as a CEO and CEO, COO and CEO, uh, she helped <clears throat> the design and implementation of the organizational uh, scalable replicable model she oversaw global operations, including technical assistance unit called Room to Read Accelerator, fundraising teams in North America, Europe, Australia, and Asia Pacific region, and a worldwide staff of more than 1,500 employees. Without much ado, Karen, floor is yours. Thank you so much. Let me go ahead and share my screen for the... And I really appreciate, Ollie, the invitation from you and to the team at the Gerhardt Center. Um, so can you see the presentation now clearly? Yes. Great. Um, so I'll thank you so much for the intro. As, as uh, Ollie shared a little bit about my background, I think at heart, I am a social entrepreneur. I was one of the three co-founders of the international education organization, Room to Read. We founded it in my early 30s. Um, and after 18 years of scaling Room to Read, I stepped down um, in early 2018 and handed over the reins of the organization uh, to one of my longtime management team members. And now I'm a managing partner at Echidna Giving, as, as Ollie said, which is one of the major private funders in the girls' education space. They were also a longtime funder of Room to Read. We focus on supporting strong Global South-based uh, implementing organizations and research and advocacy efforts that quicken the pace of progress for the girls' education sector. So that's the background I bring to this conversation today. Um, just sharing a little bit about uh, where we are now um, in terms of scaling global change. I just wanted to set a little background of On Room to Read. We were founded in 2000 in Nepal with this idea of how can we improve the quality of education for every child in their local community. We rapidly expanded um, to additional countries, adding about one country every 12 to 18 months and now operate or have programs that have, um, operate in over 15 countries worldwide. And we've always focused on strong local leadership the country director or through the programming staff um, that are best under, um, placed to be able to understand the needs and contextualize a program for each country. Um, we employ over 1,500 people worldwide. And in terms of program impact, um, I, you know, the important thing is we have two key programs. One is we focus on early grade literacy and we work in over 37,000 government schools now. Um, often our reading programs show children reading two to three times better than their government schools. We train over 10,000 teachers a year in government schools. We distribute more than 26 million books um, to date, mostly in local languages. And then our second program is our girls education program with over 85,000 girls who have gone through the program with an advancement rate to the next grade um, that is very high at 96%. And for girls coming from often very rural, um, low income settings, we have 79% that go on to enroll in, in tertiary uh, university um, education. 
We've also developed a room to re-accelerator model that is helping to provide technical assistance to governments and other NGOs on replicating our model. And all of this adds up to us on track for um, impacting over 18 million children's lives to date. So we've really taken it from this idea, this startup organization to a more mature um, nonprofit. And that's uh, really what uh, Scaling Room to Read is all about, the book. Um, we focused, um, I think, on this idea of having, um, you know, wanting to sort of share lessons learned, if you will, um, with many of the social entrepreneur community. I wrote the book with uh, Corey Heyman, the longtime chief program officer at Room to Read read a wonderful co-author and we both brought ideas about what worked in the room to read story that we could help inspire other social entrepreneurs um, and the champions that support them and wanting to also scale their program so that's going to be a little bit about what i talk about today um, there's going to be eight key lessons that i'll touch on um, i won't go through this slide now this is just a summary of them but i'll go through each of them individually um, and these are really what we saw as some of the key things that helped us um, at Room to Read, be able to reach that scale, maintain our quality, and have strategic influence um, in the space. So first, the first lesson I think that we really um, wanted to, to focus on that was hard as we were starting out was whether we could really do the impossible of helping address a complex social problem with some new solutions. And I think the important lesson from our book is that it is possible to create that change in the world. Through concentrated, focused effort at Room to Read, we know that we were able to have a big impact as a relatively small social enterprise. The world, I think, is more connected than ever before, in fact. Problems like poverty, illiteracy, climate change, you know, really do require daring, innovative solutions. COVID, in my opinion, I, um, pandemic has really made the need even greater. It's much easier, in my opinion, to create sustainable change as an organization rather than as, and then as individuals. Um, we believe it's vitally important in the Room to Read story that we built a strong, dynamic organization. You know, charismatic leaders are important, and, but they can only go so far um, as you have limited, you know, individual energy and expertise. You need to build an organization to fully maximize the output. Um, and it's difficult to think of any one person on his or her own without a lot of surrounding important people around them and a team that really sustained a major movement or change. And that's why we're so focused on um, the, I, the idea of really building a strong nonprofit organization to support these um, big audacious goals. So that's why we, we wrote Gl Scaling Global Change to share those lessons to help other entrepreneurs. Um, so that's the first lesson. The second lesson then is, you know, how did we um, do it? And the most important thing for us was how to get your grit on, as we say, or really that perseverance. In the book, one of the things we talk about is important, um, importance of organizational grit. As an organization, you go through different phases and some of them require more discipline or grit than others. Um, for example, many nonprofits enjoy kind of an extended honeymoon period um, in the startup phase where there's you know, a lot of intense and exhilarating energy, um, an exciting new cause, you're the new kid on the block. Um, but after the startup phase, you, you know, have to can keep that momentum going. And once that initial excitement has worn off, it can be challenging to maintain that momentum. Um, in some ways we likened it to what we call the sophomore slump, which is the excitement of being in high school or secondary school, your freshman, your first year is really exciting, but then you get to your, your sophomore year, your second year, and you realize you still have three more years ahead before you graduate and you have to sustain that high quality performance. Or maybe it's like a musician where they have a big hit with their first album, and then there's a slump after that. And you see a lot of nonprofits go through that in the transitional phase, um, where they have a bit of a slump. And so maintaining that momentum to get through that more mature phase of the organization really requires a lot of reorienting yourself to be more strategic, proactive in your planning, um, really pushing yourself to be disciplined in your tasks and not just handling whatever pops up day to day and just going with it. You have to really have a plan. Um, I think with the Room to Read example, you know, our startup years, kind of our first five years, we grew, grew a lot into different countries. Um, we received a lot of awards and funding and media attention, but then it started to wane and we were no longer that, that new kid on the block, as I said. Um, and we got asked a lot tougher questions about our evidence, about you know, what was really working in our programs. Staff often wanted higher compensation. It was harder to, to hire people. Um, governments really started asking a lot more questions about the quality of our work. Um, they wanted to understand more the impact. You know, all sorts of things became more difficult. So you really need to then focus on building systems fast and furious to keep up with your growth and to handle it. 
you need, you know, financial resources need to really scale. And it's often hard when you're not, you know, the newbie. Um, and there's a lot of demand and competing priorities that you have to, to um, make disciplined and, just, you know, uh, clear decisions on. So this is what we're talking about to get to that much phase. And if you look at a lot of the social entrepreneurial organizations, they really struggle, to be honest, to get to this next phase of maturity. They often um, peter out somewhere in that ending of that startup phase. So that's something to really watch for and to plan for. So going on to lesson number three, building a three-legged stool. Um, I think this is, you know, an important area for us here is another lesson that Room to Read learned is that an organization is much more positioned to scale and succeed if their organizational strategic and programmatic approaches are clear and well understood by everybody, the staff, your funders, your uh, program uh, partners, the government, you know, any key stakeholders. So what do I mean by these, you know, three areas? Well, a programmatic approach really, you know, outlines the organization's activities, their expected outputs, the intended impact you hope to have. They answer the question, what do you do and what impact do you hope to, to have? Um, those are often kind of the more traditional theories of change that you hear about with nonprofits. The operational approach um, explains how you will imp in implement these uh, programmatic activities in terms of staffing, in terms of financing, all the backbone um, parts of your organization that are really focused on improving the quality of implementation and also tracking the success over time. And then the strategic approach has helped define your plans to scale up and leverage your organizational efforts for greatest impact and system-wide adoption. Just scaling your program you know, isn't enough. None, no one organization is going to solve any of these really large complex problems. So you need to think about it from a systematic approach. You know, for Room to Read, we're trying to influence ministries of education you know, and the, the government education system. So you might focus on government systems, you might focus on market solutions, but you need to understand who you're targeting you know, for, for that leverage um, and scale up and system-wide impact. Being clear on all three of these approaches reinforces the organization's theory of change and really builds confidence over time in the organization to continue to, to drive for quality and scale. And this framework can impact, can help you guide, you know, actions at any stage. Oftentimes you have to go back and refine these theories of changes as you continue to grow and scale. They're not static, they change, um, and you need to ask more questions as you continue to deliver. So those um, is the lesson number three. So going on to lesson number four, what gets measured, what gets done. This is something that we all have said a lot at Room to Read. Um, we really focus on um, our research monitoring evaluation systems from the beginning. I think we were known as being very data-driven and evidence-based, and that was critical for our development as a social enterprise. It provides a lot of input into our internal and our external communications. Um, it improved our operating um, and design, um, scaling, you know, the organization's goals and contributing to the larger field. Everything was influenced by the data um, and evidence that we could bring. And investing early in your uh, monitoring evaluation can really help ensure that your programming is as efficient and as effective as possible. Um, you always want to be asking your question, you know, are we having the highest intended impact that we wanted to have? And you need to be able to understand how to measure it to answer that question. And it helps you in your communication to effectively, you know, help external audiences, whether they be government or partners or funders, um, to understand the impact you're having in the long run. So this is something we really started at Rune to Read very early on, and it helped design, um, influence our program design and implementation, improve our theory of change. It's important, of course, to collect and analyze um, the information and not to collect too much information because you don't want to overwhelm yourself. Um, it's also important to use the information to course correct and improve your programs or change your programs as necessary so that you can be making evidence-based decisions. I really feel that monitoring data is, is um, often undervalued. You know, it's not perfect, but it can tell you a lot. And it's important to determine, you know, which data for, is really telling you, addressing um, which, you know, for which purposes, um, answering which questions. But a lot of the experience and wisdom um, that you learn from your regular monitoring in your organization can help inform you um, to make better decisions. And a lot of those post-mortem discussions after looking at data helps you really define your next key priorities in your next annual planning goals. Um, the, you know, external evaluations are also, of course, very important, but they are pretty time consuming and expensive, um, and, but they are important in driving credibility. 
um, and invalidating your work rigorously. So you need to balance, you know, how, how do you invest in all of these areas? I think another tip is um, that we had in this area is not to be shy about sharing your findings. We found it really engaging. A lot of people wanted to know what we were learning along the way and sharing our learning agenda and how we were approaching education really helped us engage a wide movement around Room to Read through blogs and, and you know, speaking to different external audiences and stakeholders. We were honest about what's working and what's not. Again, big, no one expects any one organization to solve all problems about learning together and engaging the field. It will help build your credibility and enhance your brand visibility um, by being able to have your data be a differentiator. And that really, I think for Room to Read was a key differentiator for us. and was one of the reasons um, that so many investors chose to invest with us and continue to invest with us year after year because they believed we really were helping share um, a lot with the wider education field. So moving on to lesson number five. Um, speaking of investors, uh, I think one of the key things Room to Read did really well was um, engage a wide variety of funders. You know, as a social enterprise, cultivating, stewarding, and growing your investor base is one of the most important things that you can do to build a sustainable organization that has great impact. Everyone should feel really on your team that they're a part of the fundraising team as well. Um, they can engage investors, tell powerful stories, talk about the impact of the work, and help to you know, direct the efforts of, of your whole staff to be engaged in fundraising. It takes time to really build um, skills and processes to manage different types of, of funding streams. So one of the things I always warn organizations to is to really understand, you know, what are your main audiences of funders and where, you know, geographically do you raise most of your funding? Because raising money from individuals requires a very different approaches than from corporate foundations or institutional funders or government funders. Each audience, you know, really has a different approach and looks for different kinds of information and interaction. Um, so you want to make sure that you know where your core is of your funding base and then expand from there. You also, though, don't want to diversify too late. It's important to put a lot of time and energy into fundraising and keep thinking about how do you diversify your base? How do you, if you're good at individual fundraising, how do you approach foundations? If you fundraise a lot in North America, how do you think about fundraising in Europe or Asia? Really always challenge yourself about how can you diversify? Your team of fundraisers um, can extend really beyond your staff. We had incredible volunteer um, chapters that raised a great deal of, of funds for Room to Read and it helped us in areas when we didn't have as big of a staff. Um, and these chapters were really you know, an extension of the Room to Read team. You know, the key with fundraising, of course, is building those long-term relationships with investors. Um, you know, fund, uh, investors really fund organizations that they believe in, that they trust, that, that they know people in. So both your staff and your chapters are really important at engaging people in, in this uh, work. Most uh, philanthropic investments are really very personal decisions um, oftentimes. Um, and so it's important that you want to, you know, engage people with both the head and the heart. And by that, I mean great data about how your work is but also connecting them to stories uh, from the field and from the ground. In, in many ways, we talk about in the book, Scaling Global Change, that you want to have many people in your network that are fund whisperers who can share your work with new supporters and inspire them to give and be a part of the global movement that you're creating around your organization and your issue area. Simple, clear, and transparent messaging will help you get the word out. Um, it's not as easy to, um, as you think. You really need to be crisp and clear about the power of your work, but at this, you know, most nonprofits under invest in their fundraising efforts. And we really think of this at Room to Read as the engine, you know, the fuel that um, feeds our engine that helps us do all the other great impact work that we're focused on. So it is important to invest in this fundraising area too. Okay, so now we're on to lesson number six. It's a team sport, as we would always say at Room to Read. As we all know, great leadership is course key to building a world-class team. One of the best uh, pieces of advice from uh, that one of our board members gave me at Room to Read um, was to create a durable organization. Leaders must really anticipate skill gaps within the organization and fill them with great leaders as they continue to grow and scale. You really have to be committed to giving everyone a path to grow as far as they can grow um, and support them through professional development and invest in your HR resources in order to build a strong team. As another board member put it um, at Room to Read, you know, people don't scale, organizations scale. 
So by that, you know, you know, just a small team can't continue to grow and grow. You really have to build a uh, organizational structure that helps support your long-term durable growth. Building and sustaining a strong org organizational culture is essential as well. You know, we initially had 12 uh, core values that were to read, and we had to figure out how to narrow those down and really focus on what was most important. And by narrowing them down, we, we decided our core three uh, values were passion for education, a focus on action and innovation, and a commitment to collaboration. But get really clear and specific about those organizational values that you want every uh, member of the team of your organization to uh, walk the talk every day. Our culture at Room Direction has changed over time too. We started out being very much of a get stuff done kind of organization, move fast, move quickly. And as we matured, we, it was more important for us to get stuff done right. We wanted to transition from that startup mentality and folk, uh, that was focused really on speed. And we wanted to embrace the more strategic issues and focus on effectiveness as well as we matured. Um, we take an approach of hiring uh, you know, at Room to Read always that was um, sort of hire slowly, make sure you're hiring the right people and then part ways quickly if it's not a good fit. Um, I think two things that helped us in, in, in making good hiring decisions is that we one did really prioritize on organizational cultural fit when we we're hiring. It wasn't just skills, it was whether we thought they could be a good fit in our team. And then second, we also had a very um, tough kind of final round of interviews that was very intensive, eye-opening day. They'd spend the whole day with us. A candidate would often give a presentation on a key topic we were um, struggling with and it really allowed us to get to know a candidate and allowed them to understand our work culture and whether they wanted to sign up for the, for the experience too. And it helped us set clear expectations. You know, we haven't made many bad hires at Rundari, but when we did, it was important that we parted ways quickly because often a bad hire, um, you know, is somebody that is a great talker, but not necessarily a great doer. And we were focused at Rundari on really hiring people that got the work done and were focused on, on achieving um, a great amount with limited resources. Oh, we're very proud that Rundari over time has been a, a proud employer of choice. And in, in India, our largest country of operation, for example, We've been consistently named an employer of choice. I think these collaborative hiring processes across all of our offices, our country and our global offices really hi uh, helped. Um, hiring strong local nationals um, throughout our country offices helped ensure that we were able to really um, build a, a strong work environment in each of those country offices. Um, and it allowed us also to really focus on um, building strong relationships with the government and our partners in each country. So I think that that is key. We had a great onboarding process and just invested a lot of time in our HR capacity building to ensure that we had um, people who are passionate about working for Room to Read and love their, their job. Okay, so moving on to lesson number seven. Um, this focuses on strategic planning. A goal without um, a plan, as they say, is just a wish. And I think that's you know, true for any um, organization and for social enterprises as well. We took strategic planning very seriously at Room to Read. It was one of the main ways that we established clarity in our thinking. Um, we built that organizational grit and discipline that we talked about at the beginning. And we continue to really focus on building out big, hairy, audacious goals, as Jim Collins calls it, good to great, um, where we focused on kind of what was our true north and our big major milestones that we were aiming for. We have five-year strategic plans that we would go through um, that would help us to build that understanding across our staff, our board of directors, our investors, our partners. Um, we've had four of them so far at Room to Read uh, focusing on um, those five-year plans. And participation in the plan and developing it was very broad. For us, we um, meant that we had a, conducted a series of roundtables with our global staff, with our investors, you know, our country staff that surfaced a lot of good new ideas and it would get a lot of staff buy-in. Um, you know, I think it was important at this time, this was the time for blue sky thinking was in this process and we wanted to think bold and think big. And then once you decide in the plan, it's time to really focus on execution. So, you know, there were times when you wanted the, to be really the aperture to be very wide and to think about all the possibilities, what you could do. And then you wanted to really develop a clear plan of what did you want to achieve. And then you had to set really clear milestones for the next five years of how you're going to achieve those, those um, important goals. You know, we, we usually engaged a consultant, an external consultant 
for our development of our strategic plans because we felt that it was useful for them to facilitate those tough high state conversations and help us think big and bring in new ideas. Um, in, our, in our current plan, we had the goal um, to benefit 15 million children by 2020. And I think because we had such clear goals and such clear plans, we've um, now exceeded that um, by a few million. So it, you know, we wanted everyone, no matter where you were in the Room to Read network, to understand what the goals were and to help us drive there and get there. And that's how we used our strategic plans to really help drive that focus and that energy. So then moving on to um, lesson number eight, don't lose sight of the end game. Um, this gets at that strategic influence piece that I was talking about. Um, you know, of course, the ultimate goal is to change the world for the better, um, but there's a variety of paths you know, that any organization can take when they have you know, bold goals like that. And, and it's important to kind of understand what your pathway is. It's helpful to ask yourself questions like, you know, how do you want to ultimately affect the broader system? Is it scaling the organization? Is it scaling the program or the outcomes? You know, also, what is your exit strategy of working in certain areas or working in a program? You know, you know how do you not create dependency, but how do you, um, you know, allow others to understand your approach and your model and to learn and share from you? Having that in-game will help guide the organization to take the right action at the right time in, a, in the way to really achieve lasting social change. You know, the irony, I think, for many social entrepreneurs is that um, it, you know, after working on being a disruptor and trying to be an innovator, you also have to shift tactics and figure out how to integrate your social solutions into the existing system um, to have that lasting impact. You know, as Room to Read matured, we had to develop longstanding relationships with the government around the world than where we were working and those as ministries of education um, and plan, you know, on how did we try to influence their efforts. Um, and that's where this um, chart looks at here, where of how do you really align yourself with the government approaches and, and influence them. Um, it's important, you know, to, to focus on with each of, of each of the countries that we operate in and how do we maximize the likelihood of the system level adoption of key programs and key elements. And what we know is that bigger and more complex and costly changes are less likely to get adopted and scaled up by government. So we had to plan in our own work of how do we work with governments to show them how they can in, um, change some of their practices in education, and, but be very simple in what we were asking them to be, um, very focused on being very cost effective so that it was something that they could adopt um, and that they could scale up. Um, so that was, you know, th that is hard work that you get to as you mature as an organization and building that um, ability to scale up. But, you know, I think also with a lot of, a focused effort with goodwill, you know, also a lot of media and communication work, you can have that influence on the broader system that you're trying to influence. And we certainly saw that over the years with Room to Read. So with that, I will just conclude um, on some of the, my final points um, as we then open it up to questions. Um, we, I think, you know, one of the most important things that we really saw at Room to Read is that we were driven by passion and that's really important in sustaining yourself as a leader and sustaining your teams, your um, investors in your work, your partners. You know, it's, it's having a really core mission and being able to, to focus on that and see the change you're doing is what motivates everybody. I think also we were very big risk takers at Room to Read. Um, you know, sitting here in Silicon Valley as our headquarters um, in California, uh, in San Francisco, you know, we sort of embrace that idea here of fail fast, fail often, fail forward. Learn from the mistakes you make and keep improving and moving forward. We also thought it was important to always really think short term and, and work on the things that we could solve now, always having annual plans that were really focused, again, on what we could do and achieve and prioritize, but have a long-term vision and a roadmap for the long run of how you're going to build that sustainable organization for scale. And then again, that perseverance, that grit, one decision at a time, one pivot at a time, one crisis at a time. You have to constantly be willing to pivot and change and keep up with the pace of, of uh, the sector that you're in in order to have the greatest impact. So with that, I'll hand it back to you, Ali, and would um, love to engage in, in any questions or thoughts. Erin, thank you. It's, been, it's, it's very uh, mind-opening. I have... I have questions before I pass it to the audience. Now, my first question is, when you talk about scaling, 
of an enterprise or a startup, what are the major differences between commercial versus social enterprises? I mean, currently you see there are lots of uh, overlap, even in the terminology used, it's almost the same. Yeah. But there, there are still some basic differences, and I wanted to know what are they. I mean, I think the I think the key from um, uh, from our experience is that there are certain things that really are, um, in in our opinion, public goods, and that scaling um, up within a system where you're trying to encourage a government to adopt better practices, be more efficient and more effective in their work is often where social enterprises or nonprofits are focused in their scale up. And that does take different kind of collaboration and different kind of willingness to, um, you know, sometimes it's, it's better to go slow, but bring the government along with you than go fast and, you know, be too innovative. You have to realize what the system is you're working in. And so, so you know, if you're working, if you're trying to influence capital markets, those, you know, kind of can take different skills and techniques um, than if you're really, imp- you know, trying to scale up and influence the government. Social enterprises can do both. So in many ways, they are hybrids. I mean, depending on which market, you know, what, where you think your leverage is and where you think your the system is that you're trying to influence. But for many um, social justice, human rights, you know, issues, um, you know, kind of complex social challenges, you're really, you know, it is important to realize you're working within a community and you're working within a government system. And it's important to bring those key stakeholders along with you in this change. And I think that's probably one of the, the biggest differences. It's not just a profit driven bottom line. You're really looking at how do you affect human behavior and the social, um, you know, everything's not linear, right? When you're talking about people, people don't always make just rational decisions. Sometimes there are other reasons or there's more complex reasons why people are making the decisions they're making. So understanding those systems you're working in and how you have to influence them, I think is, um, you know, in all honesty, I think is more difficult oftentimes than just scaling up a, a business. Absolutely, absolutely. There is another way of looking at things when you, uh, this is not just uh, even commercial. When you do things based on the pyramid, you try to become a little bit more of a frugal in the way you do things. Now, interesting, when you talk about education in general, uh, there are many examples of frugal innovation. And when they talk about scaling, they apply what is called a Chinese restaurant model of scaling, which is, which is quite interesting. I, I, I don't know if you've heard the expression, the Chinese model, uh, restaurant model. And it's actually coined, I mean, it, uh, by people like, for example, Madav Shavan, who is the Batham uh, uh, German, Batham founder. Yeah. I mean, he talks about the, uh, in India, they have something called, maybe I'm spelling it wrong, but it's called Bala, Balawadi. Yeah. Which is a preschool, a, pre, a preschool, uh, uh, education for children at home. Angawadi, yeah, Angawadi, yep. Now, this is interesting because when you talk about this, you talk about less rigidity. This is not like a franchise model where you have everything yeah. carved in stone, very defined, very rigid. It's very a little loose, but it allows for it allows for organic growth. And sometimes even they, they, the expression they use, it not, doesn't scale, it spreads. Yeah. But anyway, I wanted to get your opinion about this because this is yeah, a Yeah, I know. I think it's, a, yeah, it's, I, I think, I mean, we, in, in the room to read world, we would often think about it as, um, you know, how much can we replicate kind of best practices in education? I mean, there are core principles and how you teach children to read and write um, in, you know, in any language and, in, you know, and how can some of those are um, core principles that you can apply, you know, in any language and how much it really needs to be locally contextualized, right? And, you know, I think it's a similar, you know, kind of uh, philosophy as you're, as you're speaking about where there are certain things that in order to reach scale, you want to kind of modularize things and make them sort of modules that you can kind of roll out and not have to reinvent everything, you know, new, but you want to need, leave enough flexibility that you, you have that contextualization, whether there be certain core things that are, um, you know, really different in different environments or languages or cultures um, that, you know, allows it to be really the highest impact in each place. And so what we saw over time in the, you know, 15 different places, countries that we were working in is that probably like, you know, surprisingly like 60, 70% of a lot of our core content that we we're teaching teachers or you know, are using in our books, um, our curriculum development, you know, in the classrooms, in the libraries, and our girls education life skills workshops, a lot of it had really the same core principles. And then there was that 
you know, 30% or so that you really wanted to be able to ensure was contextualized and localized. And so that helped us not have to start over brand new in each place, even within a country that, you know, take a country like India, obviously there's so much diversity within even, you know, one country. And so we didn't, you know, we didn't want to start from scratch, but we also wanted to allow that creativity. And I think that's sort of the right balance is having some level to pull from, um, but then build on. And that was something we saw really successful as a way to scale. Hey, and I, I don't want to sort of monopolize. I could ask you questions forever. I'm going to take questions from the audience. And I'm going to start with Mr. Uh, Natafo. Can you unmute yourself, sir? Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm sorry, Mrs. Can you hear me? Yes. She can hear you very well, please. Oh, OK. Thank you so much for the insightful um, session on social um, on expanding social um, impact. So my question was on the initial on the first slide. I think it's one of the few slides that you spoke about yeah. and the startup phase, um, transitional phase, I think, and the mature phase. How long did it take you guys um, to actually? Or what is the estimated time that it took you at each stage? Because I'm quite aware that uh, when it comes to education, it's really difficult for people to actually be buy into the change that you are trying to, to build. And the reason why I'm asking this question is because I'm in the process of also establishing a social enterprise in South Africa, focusing on graduates. So I mean, it yes. would be really help me to actually get a, a feel of how it was when you started in the transi right. transitional phase and yeah, the mature yeah. phase. Thank you so much. I mean, yeah, it's hard to, I think for each, you know, it, um, broad category, I would say it's probably around, you know, five to seven years in each of those phases. Um, some kind of move through them quicker and that I've seen, this is, you know, more anecdotal, just having worked with a lot of different social enterprises and thinking about, um, and, you know, kind of advising different groups. Um, I would say, you know, if you're really successful, I mean, you know, to be really honest, a lot of it depends on where your base of funding is, so how, how much you can move through them. If you're able to um, have more funding up front and in invest in greater staff and expansion of your projects, you can move through them faster. Um, but if you're also having to really scale from the bottom up a lot of your funding, then it's, you know, it can take more time. But I would say kind of around five to seven years is sort of where we've seen um, and, and, you know, Room to Read Now is this is our 20th um, anniversary. And I would say in the last, uh, you know, the last four or five years, we've kind of reached a more mature phase, right? So, um, and we are, you know, a relatively fast um, growing organization. We're just founded in 2000. We're, you know, certainly there are many um, educational organizations that are much larger than us that have been around for, you know, 40, 50 years. But as far as organizations that have been started kind of this century, we're one of the faster growing ones now with a um, annual operating budget over 50 million and working in 15 countries. And it was, you know, it took us 15 years to get to that stage. So it's, it's hard work. And I think it's, we're all impatient and we want it to be faster, but it actually really does take time to build. So I hope that helps a little bit in answering your question. Okay. Uh, Mr. Bedr. Uh, yeah, how are you? Uh, just I have two questions. I try to uh, ask it together, and uh, you could uh, you could answer it. Uh. Sure. Yeah. So the first, uh, the, my first question, uh, it's uh, regarding how you find the champion while you are scaling. You know, I, I know that if you are scaling, and especially if you are scaling internationally uh, with the same mission, it's not easy to find the champion to lead your effort uh, in these areas. So my question. How you uh, find the champion, and 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 it is easy that these champion believe in the TOC in your theory of change and uh, a business model and get the value for the organization, and uh, how you make sure that they have all these kind of things so they could run uh, this uh, entity uh, globally. So this is and my so first we, question. So by ch by champion, you mean the leader for your organization, yeah. or yeah the, yeah, the leader. So for example, you want to start something in India. Uh, yeah. It's your first time there, so you need a champion. Right, how do you find that Yeah, country director, and, uh, that leader for the team? Yeah, yeah. and how you make sure that they uh, yeah. understand that the, the, the TOC, the model, there's something behind the, right. the materials and the tools and, and these kind of things. Uh, 
Yeah. Uh, my second question is regarding why also while you are scaling, how you how you manage your flexibility in adjusting your business model and also working in systemic change while you are working in different system ecosystems. So for example, again, if you work in Africa and some country, and uh, usually the social enterprise seeking to achieve systematic change in, 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 in their uh, social cause. So maybe the, the, the system are different between countries and countries. Yeah. So how you usually make sure that the people in the country, while you are scaling, they, uh, yeah, they think shortly to achieve the outcome and result, but in the same time also they, they see the systematic change and how they could do it differently between country and country. Yes. I hope my question Great is Great questions. Yeah, thank you. So for the for the kind of key leaders and country, you know, we, what we call country directors, but the key champion, the key leader in each country, it is it's a it's a great question because that is one of the most important things that we found over time was key to our work. If we had a strong leader in each country, the program would go well. If we were transitioning between leaders or we had, you know, any challenges with um, the leadership, you really saw weakening country. And we used country dashboards to kind of help in that, as I was talking about the monitoring data of how do you really understand what works well. We had key metrics that we monitor each year. And so we could see when countries are doing really well and things were all running well and when things were really weakening and there were challenges in high turnover or program implementation quality or financial um, you know, uh, issues in the budgeting, all sorts of things that we could see that was in a weaker place. So the so we spent a lot of time looking for country directors and making sure they were, you know, they're the best um, the, the, of the best. We often found that, um, first of all, we had, as I was saying, a very intensive hiring, hiring kind of practice for that role in particular. We had not only people from in-country um, do part of the interview from the in-country management team to understand how to do that, but we also had global leadership. I, myself, as CEO, um, would interview every single new country director, you know, throughout the room to network the whole time I was there because it was such a key role. I wanted to help, you know, from um, a long-term institutional knowledge of what works well for room to read to influence that. We would go out and we re recruit quite widely. In our early days when we were smaller, we often did that by just looking at some of the other educational institutions in the country and looking for leaders, often that were like the second in command, not trying to go poach a leader from another organization, but who was the next person up and coming in some of the educational organizations were often that would really wanted to step up and be in a leadership role, but maybe perhaps because the leader was, you know, in their current organization was a founder, was going to stay there for a long time. They weren't, ha they didn't have any more growth opportunities. We would often go look for that second in command and then hire them at Rain to Read as a leader because they were really ready to step up and, and be in a bigger leadership role. Um, later, as we matured as an organization, we would um, you know, often take um, uh, use a local recruiter to help us because it was harder to find, you know, we wanted to sort of have a more robust um, system of checks and balances and being able to do reference checks and things like that on leaders as we matured. And so we would often spend you know, money to hire a recruiter because they are very key positions. And it would take you know, long months and many, a lot of interviewing to get um, key country directors. But once you had one in place, they were you know, critical to the success of the operation. Um, so that was such a critical hire for us and still, you know, still is. I think the other question on terms of that system-wide influence, the way that, you know, I think it depends a lot on what sector you're working in. So in the education sector, our belief was that we wanted to, again, as I was saying, leverage um, and influence the government education system. So our most important partner was the government. Um, and we had to build those strong connections um, to ensure that we were both aligned and understood the government's educational plans, what kind of budgets were they able to work under? How could we leverage those budgets? Cause we wanted them to co-invest in all the work and the, the extra dollars that we could bring could only be, you know, needed to be matched and kind of co-funded um, co a lot together so that they were really sustainable programs. So we were, you know, always really trying to understand what was within the government education model. That's how we really helped and contextualize a lot of our work. That was one key element. The other key element of, of course, was hiring really strong experts. We would often go to the national curriculum department, universities, you know, in the country, um, other teacher training colleges, you know, all sorts of ways in which we could integrate ourselves into the broader education ecosystem, understanding 
and building on the knowledge of a lot of those key experts, you know, in country to make sure that our work was really contextualized. So we would, you know, partner and hire consultants and develop, you know, different kinds of partnerships so that we could leverage the the in-country knowledge to make sure that what we were bringing, what you know, the, the global kind of best practices that we could bring were equally balanced, um, if not, you know, even more changed and developed by and influenced by a lot of local expertise. Um, and that, again, I think is where sometimes patience pays off. It can take longer to go through that process, but then inherently you end up with something much more relevant. And then finally, I would say the third, um, the third piece in this, and be, again, being in the education sector, but you could translate it to others, was having a strong community element. And all of our programs, whether it be the girls' education program or the literacy programs, we would work with school leaders, you know, he um, heads of school, teachers, parent committees, we would do workshops or we'd invite you know, parents in and understand and get feedback from them. We'd work with teachers who are often you know, the most, the frontline teacher was often the most knowledgeable of what really worked in classrooms. I mean, they were every day working with kids. And so we would, we would do a lot of participatory workshops where we'd understand and pilot things and get feedback and innovate and improve based on that really important field um, you know, sort of validation. So there were kind of different layers that we would go through um, that makes made sure that that really was appropriate for the system. The hard part is how do you get governments to scale up? As we all know, um, those are you know there's so many competing programs, and so often we would you know really work to develop long those relationships where we could develop a long term program where we would sort of do a set of say libraries or early literacy programs where we'd say okay we're going to do a set in this state or this province, we'll do fifty or a hundred here together, then we'll train and be the technical assistance arm to train your staff as a second phase of it. And then third, you will go do it on your own and we'll just provide you know, um, assistance behind the scenes if you need help. But it was, we try to develop a phased approach where we kind of implement the model and demonstrate it. And then we co-create and, and build their expertise in the government sector. And then we would kind of just be a technical um, um, assistance ar you know, arm behind it. And that really helped us to get a lot more ownership um, around the scale up. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Jihan Osman. Could you unmute please? Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ern, for sharing these, um, this exciting journey. Um, I had uh, several questions for you. One is related to something that you just started talking about, which is working with the government. So for anybody working as a social entrepreneur in the area of education, getting through to, as you say, um, getting through to the government so that you can integrate your efforts with whatever competing projects are happening is one of the most difficult, um, yes. difficult uh, things or parts of, of being in that area. So, uh, and I was wondering whether you could share with us some of the strategies uh, that you use um, to make that happen? Sure, I mean, I will say um, it, it's a little bit probably kind of repetitive to what I, what I said, only in the sense that I think the key th strength that we had is that we first of all had local leadership. And mm -hmm. so we were often hiring you know, people that had worked in the government um, wow. itself directly or had worked in NGOs in the education sector, but they were our best, you know, as, as we all know, things happen by relationships. We're all human, mm -hmm. right? There's no, you know, it, it's many, many of it is as building on networks that people have and have developed over time. Um, you know, many of the countries we work in, you know, there are two or three main universities that everybody goes to and they are often a very close network that then enter government service together or enter the NGO sector. And they all kind of, you know, there's a lot of, of networking that happens. And so by hiring key talent that was both knowledgeable and passionate about room to raise work, but had that strong local network often allowed us the most entree. Um, mm -hmm. So that was important. 
I think then the, the second piece that would really allowed us to get the attention of the government um, was the fact that we had this um, ability to bring evidence to them that they did not necessarily know themselves. So because we were so, so focused on mm -hmm. measuring what we were doing, you know, we could go and we could say, you know, look, here's the level, the reading levels teacher, uh, uh, children are reading at in the local language, you know, that is subpar to them being really fluent readers let you know then this was the baseline then over time after being in a school that had a room to read program you know after year one this is what it looked like after year two this is what it looked like and being able to speak from that evidence base really helped us get attention because again a lot of charismatic leaders a lot of anecdotal sto uh, stories you know governments have a hard time you know what are they going to do with that right they're like we're a whole big system we can't just trust you like we actually need you know more hard evidence so i think again that monitoring and evaluation of um investments and the data and being able to then parse the data it's not just data for the sake of data i mean you have to parse it and really analyze it and tee it up in policy briefs so that governments um you know, can, can take on the information and understand it. I mean, you know, governments are getting approached as, as you're well saying by so many, and they're constantly being, um, you know, sort of approached by different NGOs as well. So you need to find a way to kind of crisply and clearly get your message through. And I think some of the, um, you know, data is a really great way to be able to do that and to demonstrate the power of your projects. And then, and then finally, the third, again, was community support. I mean, often it would be schools, we would kind of work in certain areas, and we might saturate a province after several, um, you know, after a few years of working in an area, we might be working in maybe 40 or 60% of the schools in that area. And that was a lot of that was word of mouth, we start working in a school, and then the other schools, parents would be, you know, changing their switching their kids and saying they're getting a better education over here. And then the schools down the road would be like, what's going on in that school? And, you know, they'd come and say, we want this program as well. And then we'd start working in that school the next year. And, you know, that kind of builds that kind of community um, momentum builds. And then you start to get noticed once you're, you know, and then working in a number of schools and areas. So consolidating our work, I think in certain areas and not spreading ourselves too thin, that was a tipping point. Cause once we started working in 40, 60%, you know, the, the, then the, the, provincial or state governments and the national governments is like, hey, what's going on over here? We keep hearing about Room Trees program. What is it? How is it working? What's the secret sauce in your work? You know, so you start to get that tipping point where you get momentum. Okay, uh, next question is from Jiva Munsami. Hi. Uh Thank you, Erin, and uh, thank you to the organizers. It was a wonderful uh, presentation. I work in the, at the university in the field of community engagement. And I, I know you mentioned the university, but I want to know what role have you used the students specifically in terms of community engagement, like service learning and so forth? And then secondly, um, do you work with volunteers without paying them? Great. So this, yes, for universities, we would often partner. Um, I will say we, we partner probably more through a professor or through a department. Um, and, you know, if a, particularly in a lot of our monitoring evaluation work where we're looking at doing, you know, some joint collaborative research, that's a great way to get students involved where they may be able to be, um, you know, kind of the the boots on the ground or the feet, you know, the um, on the street that help go out and do a lot of the data collection, do a lot of you know the mm -hmm. analyzing. But that would that often is how we would work through with a, you know a department that would be able to add those extra resources because our teams wouldn't be able to do that. But it usually was under the auspices of a research project or kind of a, a you know trying to do some qualitative or quantitative collection to be able to um, leverage you know students. We do use volunteers, um, though, often in our programs um, in country because we don't allow actually foreign volunteers to do any work because it's not helpful to our country teams. They want people obviously speak the language and understand the context. And so we would partner um, our different country offices would and um, have ways in which people could either get involved, you know, with the schools directly in their communities and volunteer and be teachers, uh, you know, teacher assistants or library assistants. There's always kind of a community um uh, membership, you know, around the library often where you can have people come in and do work. 
Um, often with our corporate, local corporate funders, they would have employees that would want to get involved and do volunteer service days, you know, different ways that we could leverage um, through the country offices. But that was absolutely at the discretion of the country offices that knew how to best maximize that and how to leverage the resources, you know, in our girls education program, they would, for example, look for um, women off, often that could come in and be um, models and role models and speakers at different sessions to represent, you know, you can't be what you don't see, right? So they would want women to come in and be able to help speak with the girls and do, you know, mock interviewing skills and different kind of um, life skill workshops where they could really be role models for the girls. And that was incredibly important for them to see because, you know, many, if you look through a classroom industry, programs uh, most of the mothers you know of the children that we were working with you know, might have gotten um, through third fourth fifth grade they probably would not have even graduated primary school much less gone on to secondary school so we were really drawing on other community members and volunteers to be able to help be those role models and that's um, I think a very powerful as we know in the girls education work that's a really important and powerful um, piece of of understanding and being able to demonstrate the um, ambitions and powers of, you know, of, of seeing other women in positions that are so important. Thank, Thank you so question. much. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, the last question is from Dara Rashwan. Dara, please unmute yourself. Um, yes, okay, so hi, Erin. Um, I wanted to ask two questions. I wanted to ask, what would you advise anyone who wants to start a startup? And what was the hardest part of being a startup in the beginning? Well, I would, I definitely um, would advise to just jump in and do it. I think that, you know, if you have the passion and you have the, um, you know, the desire and goal to really, you know, to give back and to do something that you deeply care about. There's no more satisfying work and you know um, more rewarding work than to obviously be working in the social sector. And in my personal mm. opinion, after you know several decades, um, I think you do just have to sort of go for it sometimes because you can overanalyze and try to write business plans and predict what's going to happen. But it, you know there is really um, no clear roadmap. Every Every organization, you know, grows and scales differently. Um, you know, there's, there's, it's hard to predict. So you kind of just have to jump in. And that's why with scaling global change, we wanted to say, you know, it, it's really about creating a, a high power team, having a clear um, theory of change and approach, and then making those decisions one by one and pivoting as you go along the way, because it will be a windy road to, you know, to get there. Um, I think in terms of, of um, sorry, Dar, what was your second question? You had said, um, in terms of, of advice? Dara? Yes, my second question was, what was the hardest part about being a startup? Oh, the hardest part, yes. Well, I will say the hardest part, I think, um, and this is actually evidence I've seen um, from different organizations that ha sort of look at social entrepreneurship and see over time, what is hardest? The two things that were most difficult um, were both fundraising and hiring and retaining top talent um, as we scaled. I think the fundraising, particularly in the early days and the startup days, is really challenging. You have to, um, you know, as a leader, you're often spending, you know, 50, 60, 70% of your time fundraising in the, you know, the early years, which I don't think any of us start an organization necessarily to just do the fundraising part. We start it for a lot of other, you know, reasons of caring deeply about the work. But the reality is you need to be able to, you know, have that, that fuel for your engine to really, you know, kickstart the organization. And that requires a lot of getting out there, writing grants, um, you know, meeting high net worth individuals and asking for funding, building in a, a dynamic and diverse funding base. And so that was hard work at the beginning. And then over time, as we started to get more resources in and build kind of a track record of impact, um, I think the hard part was the challenge in just you know, competing for talent. There's, it's in many of the countries that we operate in, you know, the nonprofit sector is a very vibrant sector. It's um, people are constantly moving. You know, you're competing with the UN, um, you know, and really large INGOs that can pay a lot more money um, than a smaller organization. Um, and so you're, you know, constantly seeing turnover in your staff and you're constantly trying to go out and find um, and retain that staff. And so creating a work environment and an organizational culture, which I think is why I spoke so much about that, is that is your greatest weapon. 
If you can create a place that people love to work and they feel empowered, they feel that there's career growth and opportunity for them. They feel they can have direct impact. They feel that there is lots of flexibility, that it can be locally contextualized. It's not just a global model can apply to this country, but it's actually has a lot of depth and innovation coming from within the country. If you create that work environment, you can really compete. And it's not, most people don't really just take jobs on salary. I mean, particularly in the social sector, that's not the greatest motivation. The greatest motivation is working in a place you love with people you love um, on a mission that you care deeply about. And I think that's one of the best things that we did at Room to Read was create a place that just had some incredibly dedicated long-term people that you know really felt that they were doing the best work that they could be doing in their lives. Uh, thank you, Dara. Thank you, Erin. It's been very, uh, really, really uh, insightful. I, I have a comment, and it's more coming from academia. Usually people looking at academia, they will look at when you do a study based on one uh, sample, a sample of one, as not as rigorous as right. etc. Et <laughs> but I'll, I'll give you an interesting example. Peter Drucker, has yes. a, one of the very first books of Peter Drucker is called The Concept of a Corporation, of the Corporation. And it's really the book that laid the ground for most, most of the organization theory and the management theory. And it was basically a two-year study of General Motors. Yeah. I mean, Sloan at the time asked him to come and study General Motors. And it's usually the case when you're talking about a very pioneering uh, example. There aren't like... Uh, 30, 40 cases that I could study them so I can get you the statistical significance that you want. Right. So the qualitative studies that depends on studies of one often carries tremendous amount of value, even from an academic point of view. This is just a comment. Uh, again, yes. I, really, I really thank you for a very insightful webinar, a great discussion. And... Uh, well, thank you, Ollie, for fantastic. having me. Thanks for all the f f fantastic questions. I deeply believe in social entrepreneurs that can change the world. And so I hope that we can all go out and do the hard work that we know that it takes, but it's very worthwhile work. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you, ma'am. Now, next week, we're going to have two, two great webinars. On Monday, we're going to have Bruno Roche. Bruno is the founder and a leader of economics of mutuality. And he's going to talk about economics of mutuality, which is really a groundbreaking management innovation based on 15 years of in-depth academic research and business practice. Business practice is basically Mars, the chocolate company. Uh, academia is basically Oxford University. Uh, and it empowers companies to adopt a more responsible and more complete form of capitalism that is fairer and performs better than purely financial version operating today. This is on Monday. On Wednesday, we're going to have Frank Aswani, Dr. Frank Aswani. He's the CEO of Africa Venture Philanthropy Alliance. And he will talk about the landscape of Africa, African venture philanthropy. So stay tuned. See you soon. See you soon. Thank you, Erin, again. Please Thank stay you. safe. And we'll be in touch again. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good night.